up at yeah. Waterloo and offer their services free of charge yes. to, to transport veterans across to Whitehall. OK, and that will be um, another amazing weekend, uh, I'm guessing. Let's talk about our, our special guest today. Introduce mm. her for us. Yep, so we're really delighted to have Liz McConaughey yeah. join us. Um, Liz is an amazing woman. I might, I'll probably call her mate, but uh, <laughs> she knows where I'm coming from. Um, Liz, over Well, to hang you. on, you missed the best bit. Former member of the RAF, known as the Chinook Crew Chick, which I have to say uh, is not words that, that normally we would be speaking at this, in this uh, time of uh, political correctness. Yeah. But that's what yeah. you called you. So we've got a book out uh, under the same title. Um, the Chinook Crew Chick. Why is that the name? Tell well, us. Well, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Lots of radio presenters have fallen over at the first hurdles, right, to right. pronounce it. Um, and actually, the publishers originally wanted to call it Chinook Girl. Right. But I've never been called a girl in my life, no. in my career. So, um, yeah, I was nicknamed Chick, you know, on the squadron. That's right. what they called me. I also had the nickname of Doris right. a lot of the time. And that came from World War II. It's actually a term of affection. OK. And, you know, again, in today's political society, mm. lots of people could take offence of that. But actually, it was a really nice way to feel loved by the squadron and, yeah. and the lads that I worked with. So, yeah. I feel... And Chinooks, are, for those of the people who are not who are not familiar with them, are those two huge helicopters you see with the double blades, right? They are. They're the most distinctive. Yeah. You see them sometimes flying up and down the Thames. Yes. Um, I'm told there's some kind of SAS uh, point at which they, Normally they land. Normally in the Honourable Artillery Company. And I can always hear them. I used to live quite near Salisbury Plain. Um, and you'd see them carrying tanks in those great big nets and things like that. Yeah. Maybe I even saw you flying one of them. Um, quite possibly. But how did you end up flying a Chinook? Because it's not the most obvious <laughs> it's job not, that you'd want to No, do. it's not an obvious career choice, is it? So I actually went along with my brother whenever he joined the army and yeah. he was in doing his barb test, which is the entrance exam for the army. And I was sat in the careers office at the time killing time and there was a magazine on one of the tables there and it had a guy hanging out the side of a helicopter on what I thought was a piece of rope mm. and I asked the chap in uniform what's this job with the guy on the rope and he said well for starters it's a wire right. and the job title is helicopter crewman and I remember just being sold at that point I thought that's what I want to do with my yeah. life <laughs> I didn't really know much about it at that point and yeah. I guess it was only about two or three years really into the job that I really understood the gravitas of what yeah. the job was about right. obviously found myself in Iraq age 21 so I was right. the youngest air yeah I was going to say I mean the great thing about meeting people like yourself is that you say these things with such sort of ease I ended up in Iraq at age 21 yeah where there was a war yeah right so I mean you know that must have been a bit uh, scary at first well I think you know you a lot of people, you join the military to do a job, mm. and I'm, I feel very lucky with the slice of time whenever I joined. I joined in 2001, I was only 19, and because of that slice of time, it was a week after 9-11, mm. and that meant that I did get to go to Iraq, and I went and deployed there twice. It was after the war fighting had finished, so a lot of routine tasking. Mm. And then in 2005, the Chinook force pulled out of Iraq and went to Helmand, went right. to Afghanistan, and I did 10 deployments in Afghanistan by the end okay. of my career. But I feel very lucky to have had that slice of time mm. to be able to do all that and right. have that purpose and you know, really make a difference on a right. war zone. And I mean, the difference presumably between flying around uh, in places like Salisbury uh, to, to, to practice dropping stuff and carrying jeeps and all that kind of thing yeah. takes on a slightly different hue. It does. Presumably when you've got the possibility of somebody shooting you out of the sky. Yeah. I mean, well, it was a heck of a lot know, warmer, for starters. A lot warmer, but, um, as well. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know, the main thing, that was uh, the first thing, being a girl from Northern Ireland, mm. the heat whenever I first deployed to Iraq was the first thing that really hit me. But you're right, you know, out there we have the minigun fitted to the front of the aircraft, which yeah. is a huge weapon, so it always makes me laugh that it's referred to as the minigun because there's yeah. nothing mini about it. And it fires 3,000 rounds a minute, so it is that a show of quite force. serious. Yeah. yeah, it is some serious firepower. And... You know, we have to man that weapon. It's our job to defend all of the crew on board and any passengers that were flying right. around in those battle zones. And unlike the guys on the ground who can take cover, get behind a compound, right. go into a ditch, we have to stand behind that weapon right. and stand our ground to defend yeah. it. So, you know, it's, it was... you know. And did you have <laughs> any uh, moments which were kind of close calls? I mean, I don't know, I don't know ask you how often you use the weapon, but, but, I mean, did you ever have to avoid something that was being fired at you? Absolutely. You know, that's part and parcel of being on a Chinook. You know, we were the heartbeat of the campaign in Helmand. Yeah. And part of that task was the MERT, which is the medical emergency response team, where we would have to go into a lot of hot landing sites to get yeah. the casualties out because right. they had less than an hour to live. Right. So we had to go in. And very often, you know, in the early days of the campaign, there weren't that many troops up the Helmand Valley. You know, Bastion was being built and there was a couple of board operating bases, but there wasn't a huge footprint mm. of British soldiers. But as the campaign grew and years went on, from about 07, away onwards 
you know, we had a huge amount of British troops mm. pepper potted up the Helmand Valley. And it stands to reason the more boots on the ground, the more bullets are going to fly, yeah. the more IEDs are going to get stood on. So being shot at became quite frequent business, really. Uh. And we, nor I think as a whole fleet, we normalised that. You know, I look back at how, I guess, different and in, indifferent in I really got to being shot at by the end of the campaign. You know, mm. it was, I've had two very near misses in my life and I've got two bullets at home that have missed me by less than a foot. Wow. Yeah. You can hear them when they're that close, can't you? Yeah, and it's very difficult to identify firing points when you're yeah. in a Chinook because you've got dust being kicked up by the downwash around the aircraft. And generally, it has to get pretty close to you before you can hear it. Right. And it's like a little metal ting, ting, ting around yes. you. And if you can hear it, you know it's close. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> That's right. That's the problem. So, I mean, you can't really take evasive action in one of those things either, can you? No, whenever we're on the ground, sadly, because the way that the, the weapons are configured, and that's mainly so that we don't shoot the ends of the blades off, um, they have they have stops on the weapons. And that, that means it's incredibly difficult to actually bring the weapon to bear mm. when you're on the ground. So actually you've got much better uh, options whenever you're on approach or taking off yeah. from the landing site. Did you ever think at any point, this is quite a ridiculous and amazing situation I'm in currently, or was it just very much your job and it was just, this is what I do? Yeah, and it's all relative. You know, I've been to some, well, I've been to lots of war zones, but I've never felt as safe as in the back of a Chinook, funny enough. Yeah. And I do think it's relative in that we met a couple of EOD guys out in, in Helmand and we were all sat in a, in a crew room together and he asked what we did and we said, oh, we're the Chinook crew. And he said, that's the most dangerous job out here. There's no chance I would ever mm. want to do what you guys do. Right. And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, EOD. So they go and look for obviously bombs and unexploded devices. Yeah. And I said, I'd never do that. And I think it's all relative. You know, right. your training builds you up to right. be able to do the job effectively right. and to be quite comfortable in that environment. Mm. So, yeah. So when you have a near miss, it's very regular for a soldier to say, everything's, from, everything's for free from now on, boss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely right. And I mean... You know, in terms of the way you said that, they, that, that there was a lot of camaraderie and there was a lot of banter and all that kind of thing. I mean, we've been reading this week about the uh, the RAF um, and the Red Arrows and all of that and people being sort of horrified at what was going on there. I take it in a war zone, it's not really like that. No, everyone's got a job to do. Yeah. And, you know, very much from day one in the Air Force, from my experiences, I was just made to feel like one of the lads. Yeah. You know, it's like having 60 big brothers on the yeah. squadron. And I also think, you know, there's so many other females out there in the forces who don't need a sun headline or a newspaper headline about what they're doing. Mm. They just want to get on with the job and do it to the right. best of their ability. And, you know, if, you, if I expected some extra fanfare or someone to say, isn't she good doing that job, despite the fact she's a woman, it's almost like saying you're not capable in the first place. So yeah. I don't, I, I never expected any extra rounds right. of applause or red carpets rolled out for me doing my job because right. we were all doing it together. You know, uh -huh. We're all in it together. And so you left in 2019 and then things didn't go so well. So what happened when you left? Yeah, so I... I, I ended up getting medically discharged. I think, you know, the Chinook is not a kind aircraft to fly mm. around on to the body. And having spent over 3,000 hours flying around in that thing, wearing a heavy helmet and the night vision goggles that mm. we wear a lot of the time. And then obviously when you're out in Op Park, you're wearing your body armour as well and, and hanging underneath the aircraft to look at the hooks. So I ended up damaging two vertebrae in my neck and sadly mm. got medically discharged in 2019. Um, and, you know, it was the job I'd always wanted to do. Coming back to how I got into the RAF, I'd seen that magazine. And, you know, we have a bit of a joke in the RAF. If you cut me in half, you'd see a round doll. Mm. And I was that girl, you know, right. cut me in half. I'm literally those colours. And the job wasn't just a job to me. It was who I was. And then, you know, 37, I might, you know, the yellow brick road's gone and I'm yeah. out as a civvy. So I find it very difficult to adapt to life. And in 2020, when we got locked down, I was suddenly on my own in my apartment in Basingstoke, where I live, which isn't far from the base I, I worked at. And a lot of the things I'd seen in Op Herrick started to catch up with me. And as the year went on, I kind of unraveled slowly. I developed insomnia. And I think, you know, that lack of routine that we all have in the forces yeah. had gone during COVID for a lot of people. And certainly one of the things I'd used as a coping mechanism for a lot of the stuff that I'd seen on the MERT, on that medical emergency response team, so the flying ambulance. Yeah. Some of the stuff we were seeing over the years was very traumatic in terms of bodies and bits of bodies down the back of the aircraft. But I'd always coped with that by running. Mm. And in the first lockdown, we were allowed out for 10 minutes a day. Right. And that, you know, for me, who used to run and run and run was just not enough. So I didn't even put my trainers on. So I'm now in this scenario where I've got no purpose, no reason to get dressed in the morning, no routine. That led to insomnia. And I knew I was in a really bad way when later on that year, I was looking up some of the soldiers who had picked up a Mert who had never made it back, who had died in the back of the aircraft. And, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning. I've got my logbook out. I'm Googling these guys to see if they fathers, were they, you know, married did they have kids mm. one guy had proposed to his fiance before he deployed and never made it back so all the red flags were there in terms of me not being in a good way mm. 
but I never reached out for any help. And I think that's because personally looking back, it's probably because I didn't want to burden anyone. Mm. You know, veterans right. are very bad at that. We never yeah. want to ask for help generally as a bunch of people. And certainly I think being the only female doing my job for quite some time, even though none of the lads would have ever made me feel like I was a burden if I'd yes. like gone and had a cry around the back of the tent after a bad day. You know, some of them did, but I never wanted to be the girl that was yeah. was doing that. And that all came from inside me. That was never an external So how pressure. did you break that cycle then? So I didn't. I ended up uh, a couple of weeks later after that moment, um, woke up one morning and decided that it was going to be my last day on earth and spent the entire day planning my suicide. And I actually reached out to the GP for some help that morning. Um, I, I said, this is me, I'm, I'm feeling suicidal, I'm quite scared about, you know, everything. And all they did was prescribe me some antidepressants. So I actually went across that afternoon, picked up more antidepressants, mm. as well as the ones that I'd actually, been, uh, another drug that I'd been given for my neck. And that evening, 95 amitriptyline, and, and that was it. Wow. I don't remember much after that. No. <laughs> but the fact that I'm sat here Somebody with you today... Somebody found you, though, presumably. Well, I woke up two days later in Basingstoke Hospital in the high dependency unit. And I didn't know how I got there. There was a clock at the end of the bed and it said half past six. And I thought it was the next morning. And it actually wasn't. It was two days later and I'd been on life support for two days. Wow. And it's like one of those nights you go out for a drink and you don't remember how you get home when you've drunk too much. It <laughs> yeah. was like that times ten. Never happened to me. No, no. no. no I don't know what you're talking happened. about. No, 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 no. Of course <laughs> no not. No idea. But I didn't know how I was alive. You know, yeah. I had no idea how I'd got there. And, you know, had I phoned an ambulance or had a neighbour or a friend, I had no idea. And it was only another two days after that when I was released from hospital and got home, I was reunited with my phone that was back in my apartment. And it turns out that I actually called Samaritans for 13 seconds that night mm -hmm. at 10 to 1. And then I'd called 911. And it was that call that had no. saved my life. No. Which proves there's a will inside us all to survive. You know, no matter how bad and like in that state of depression you get, there's something inside us all that wants to survive. Yeah. And subconsciously I'd made that phone call, which saved my life. And but I was very that, lucky. And do you think that that... Is, is that it for you now? You're not going to get back to that place where you found yourself? You... No. I I must admit, I came out of hospital and I remember thinking, well, that's, you know, the only way is up now because it's never going to get worse than the day yeah. you tried to kill yourself. And I was so wrong. The rest of it's free, is that Yeah. Say? Well, I was about to start the biggest yeah. battle of my entire career and that was putting life back together, really. You know, if I'd have just scooped up all those files that I'd thrown on the floor that, that day when I took the overdose, if I'd have just scooped them all up and folded them back in my brain, mm. I think I'd still be a ticking time bomb waiting to go off again. Yeah. And the important process of that PTSD counselling was reading and acknowledging all the things, all the files, I guess. Acknowledging that trauma, you know, you don't run and cut your knee mm. and not expect your leg to bleed. No. So why do we experience trauma and not expect the body to have a reaction in terms of crying? Yeah. But we are, I think, as a nation, never mind as, as forces people, extremely bad at showing that. Yeah. And I'd stored up 10 years of tears, so it all had to come right. out. Yeah. Wow, what a story. Yeah, and I think um, this period we're going into now of remembrance, let's, let's not forget there will be an awful lot of veterans out there who will, will see and feel the black dog mm. reappear. Yeah. The black clouds will come back. The memories will come. Because they'll be thinking yeah. about it and we try and box it and move on. We're all guilty of it. Box it, compartmentalise, move on. You know, and get stick yourself your nose into something else, whether it's work or alcohol or whatever. Yeah. But this is a time where all of us have to keep an eye on our mates. Yeah. Reach out, mm -hmm. do our buddy checks, yeah. and make sure that we're all okay. Because yeah. it's, it's a tough time sure. for many, many who are still alive. There'll be right. so many veterans who won't yeah. leave the house on Remembrance Day. Yeah. And two years ago, I had been invited along to the cenotaph to march with the Mert. Yeah. And it was their inaugural year. So I was amongst colleagues and old friends in a really safe environment. And four days beforehand, I had a huge anxiety attack and had to pull out. And there's a lot was in the background mm -hmm. to get people involved in the Cenotaph March. You know, there's lots of security checks. And I felt like I was letting people down by not going. And I eventually managed to go last year. And I have to say, for anyone watching this who feels like they can't leave the house or doesn't want to go to a service or stands at the back and doesn't want any, any kind of people to notice that they're there, it was the, the best cathartic experience to actually go and realise that the camaraderie, those mates, and like Hugh, Hugh said, that buddy-buddy feeling, mm. suddenly, you know, even just pitching up at Waterloo and seeing all the taxis lined up yeah. waiting to take us across, you know, you suddenly feel like people actually do care about you and it's, a, you know, a really good way to kind of reconnect with yeah. people. And those people with shared experiences are the people who will be the best for mental health because yeah. they're the people you can talk to. Wow. And I know, Hugh, that that's what you work towards all the time is getting support for people who who really knew. Well, listen, I've got to thank you, Liz, for coming in. Very kind. And what a great story, an amazing story. And a book which presumably tells the story 
in a bit more detail. Uh, the book's called uh, The Chinook Crew Chick. Yeah. Available at all decent bookstores, I presume. Yeah. yeah. Hugh, Andre, thank you very much indeed. Thank Again, you, as ever. And, and of course, we'll be talking more because it is Remembrance Month and, yeah. and uh, we will be coming up to Remembrance Sunday. I can and just say thanks so much. And an awesome story. Hugh brings me some of the most incredible people, I have to say. The Veterans Voice, thank you. I think we have to give her a Veterans Voice salute. I think we absolutely do. I'm not even <laughs> going to pretend you. to try and salute because I would <laughs> make a mockery of it and it wouldn't be fair and I shouldn't be allowed to. Uh, but coming up, the US.